our curator of archaeology, introduced John. start by asking if you can hear me in the back. Yeah, it's okay. Can everybody hear? I'd rather not use a microphone if I don't have to, but I can. <coughs> well, I, thought, I want to thank you, Jerry, and thank you, Janine, and the Cooper Center for bringing me down, Cal State Fullerton, Department of Anthropology. Uh, yesterday, I had a great tour of the Cooper Center, and they're doing amazing things there with the deep history of Orange County, the fossil record, the archaeological record made a tremendous amount of progress in a short amount of time. You should all be really proud of what they're doing and also support what they're doing as much as you can. I also had a, a great afternoon and evening with Cal State Fullerton faculty and graduate students and undergraduates and uh, I'm just deeply appreciative that you all brought me down. I'm a Southern California boy. I live in Oregon. It rains up there almost all winter. <laughs> so it's awfully nice to come down here and get some sunshine. What's that? Okay, well, let's calibrate this now. Can you hear me better? Okay, I'll use it, that's fine. Um, what I wanna do tonight is talk a little bit about the peopling of the New World, peopling of the Americas, um, especially some of the recent evidence that is suggesting some new insights, some new ideas about how and when the Americas were first people. I've been engaged in this research for a long time there's still a lot to be learned. There's still a lot that we don't know. But I'll give you, I guess, maybe my perspective at the moment of what I think was happening. And I'm going to start on a very global basis. This is what Brian Fagan taught me to do as an undergraduate at UC Santa Barbara. And then I'll come to Calif well, North America and then to California, to the Channel Islands where I've been working for 40 years. And then I'll try to wrap up in that kind of broad context again. So let's get started. One of the things that I've been talking about for the last few years is that there's some really interesting things going on on a global basis and also right here in California, California, Southern California. And so what I'm basically saying is that the archaeology of coastlines, aquatic adaptations and how you know, humans have lived in marine and aquatic ecosystems through deep time and also human dispersals is at a convergence of four paradigm shifts in anthropology. One of those is a new theory that our hominid ancestors evolved adjacent to um, not dry savannas, but next to aquatic habitats. Uh, and that aquatic foods were actually critical to the evolution of larger human brains, hominid brains. Another one is a consensus that Homo sapiens, people like us, anatomic, anatomically modern humans, evolved relatively recently, 200,000 years ago, maybe 250,000 years ago, in Africa, followed by a rapid spread around the world after somewhere between 60 and 80,000 years ago. This was an idea that started to crystallize in the 1980s, but has become more and more supported, as the anthropologists in the audience know, by genetic evidence and archaeological evidence. Another one is a rejection of a theory from the 20th century that seafaring, intensive fishing, and coastal adaptations only developed in the last 10 to 15,000 years. Part of the broad spectrum revolution and kind of an intensification, intensification of human economies at the end of the Pleistocene that was basically contemporary with and related to the advent, origins, development, and spread of agriculture. And fourth, the collapse of the Clovis First model. Clovis First, in terms of the peopling of the Americas, the New World, <laughs> 
suggested that the Clovis peoples of about 13,000 calendar years ago, I'm gonna be talking in calendar year, years tonight, not radiocarbon years, that they were the very first people in the new world and gave rise to all the subsequent technological and cultural traditions that we see archeologically in the Americas. And with the rejection of Clovis first, there's also been a transformation of what we call the coastal migration theory, the idea that people follow coastlines from Northeast Asia into the Americas from marginal to mainstream. I'll say at the outset that when I was doing my dissertation in 1988 at UCSB, uh, one of my advisors told me that I really should not write about the coastal migration theory. Because at that point, it was not popular, it was marginal, and he suggested that I might actually ruin my career if I wrote very much about it. I ignored his advice, thankfully, uh, but I also wrote about it very carefully. And I've always been careful to talk about it as a model and a theory that even today continues to require further research and testing. All right, so let's start with those four paradigms quickly. Uh, here's a couple of quotes, one from uh, Sherry Washburn and C.S. Lancaster in 1968. For early man, water was a barrier and a danger, not a resource. This just meant that hominins basically tried to avoid aquatic habitats uh, for as long as possible. Clive Gamble, uh, in a really, I thought, brilliant book, other than one lapse, called Time Walkers that talked about the dispersal of humans around the world. In 1996, he listed 10 important homin habitats that hominins encountered as they spread around the world, and not one of them was aquatic. You know, it was mountains and savannas and tropical rainforests. Nothing about coral reefs, kelp forests, estuaries, uh, straits, oceans, things like that. And then a good friend of mine, David Yesner, in 1987, wrote this. It's a historical fact that maritime resources were not exploited until relatively late in prehistory. A real commitment of maritime lifeways did not precede the late Upper Paleolithic, 15,000 to 10,000 years ago. David's one of the smartest guys I know, but he was wrong. Well, I also, in the interest of full disclosure, want to put up this warning. My personal history just might lead me to question some of these 20th century paradigms. Because I grew up in Hawaii and Santa Barbara, and I was in and out of the water constantly, swimming, surfing, sailing, diving, the whole thing. Mike Mako, is he here? Well, he's fortunate he's not. He's a, <laughs> he's a local guy, Orange County guy now, but I went to graduate school with him. That's him in 1978 with me after we built a replica of a Shumash Kaswa Itomal, which is a Thule Reed boat, and paddled it with a case of beer from Gaviota to El Capitan. And uh, then fortunately, it subsequently broke up on the rocks because he wanted to take it to the Channel Islands, and I really didn't. <laughs> anyway, you know, my background might have led me to ask some questions about some of these theories. And what part of what I've learned over the years is that coastlines, obviously, you all live near the coast, and I think you probably understand this. Coastlines can be remarkably productive. They provide not just resources from the land, but resources from the sea. They're an ecotone where the land meets the sea, where a vi variety of resources are found, a wide variety, and oftentimes a great productivity of resources. This is a picture from the Oregon coast where there are mussel beds at low tide, barnacles, gooseneck barnacles, these require virtually no technology whatsoever. They're protein rich, meat sources, uh, and why on earth would hominins ignore coastal ecosystems like this, especially if they had the requisite technology? Now these resources don't require a lot of tools, but other ones oftentimes, fishing, sea mammal hunting, bird hunting, do require some specialized technologies that were only developed later in time by anatomically modern humans. But it always seemed kind of nonsensical to me that early hominins would ignore these kind of resources, especially when we know they were living in some coastal regions, the tools are there, and that they also were probably you know, quite good observers of the natural world and saw all sorts of other things like monkeys and apes and birds eating these resources. They would have known that they were edible and they wouldn't have ignored them. 
So how did anthropological theory come up with the idea in the late 20th century that they did ignore these resources? Well, it's fundamentally a problem that has to do with sea level rise, sea level fluctuation, and the visibility of the archaeological record in coastal areas. And here's, this is, shows it, okay? Glacial and interglacial cycles over the last 900,000 years. Sweeping changes with ice sheets forming, sea levels lowering at that point, ice sheets melting, sea levels rising. In some cases, sea levels moved as much as 500 kilometers from their present positions. And even here along the California coast, they often moved 10, 20, 30 kilometers over the last, say, 18,000 years when humans first moved into the New World. Uh, here's a blow up of this last interglacial, about 125,000 years. Sea levels were actually higher than they are today. They're headed in that direction again, folks. Four to six meters above present back then. Um, and here it just shows that when sea levels were relatively high, there weren't humans in Australia or the Americas, so we can't expect any kind of coastal record there. But even in Africa, where we know that hominins existed, in Eurasia, where they existed, there's a gap in the archaeological record that's very hard to bridge. It goes from this period of lower sea level to basically somewhere up in here as sea levels rising again about 15,000 years ago. Sea levels were 50 meters below present, 120 meters below present, and that means the shorelines moved far away from modern. And as they rose, they flooded those areas where coastal peoples would have lived and left minimal evidence for coastal dispersals that followed coastlines or people who lived in coastal regions. And as a result, you have to look in very specialized areas, and even then it's very challenging. The places we've learned to look are areas where the shorelines are very steep, where the bathymetry drops off quickly, and shorelines didn't move very far laterally during these fluctuations in sea levels. And when you filter that into a picture of where around the world we see evidence for marine resource use, it's always next to those areas of steep bathymetry, which suggests that we're missing basically 90% of the record. We have the tip of the iceberg, and that's all to interpret this deep history of human interaction with marine ecosystems. Well, let me review quickly a little bit of what we do know. These, in, this information was dismissed for years, but Kathleen Stewart and other people who were working in East Africa have found a variety of living sites associated with Homo habilis, Homo erectus, some later hominids that suggest that they were eating fish and other marine uh, aquatic organisms like crabs and stuff, crocodiles, things like that. And starting, I mean, as much as two million years ago, uh, up to 800 million, 800,000 years ago. And what's dry land today, you know, looked like this back then. And as a lot of these lake systems dried seasonally, they often left fish just like this, rafts of fish along the edge of dried up rivers, streams, lake systems, or ponds, where they could easily be picked up by hominids, scavenged, if you will, with no technology. And again, why would they ignore these resources? The answer is that they didn't. And there's growing amount of evidence that uh, earlier hominins access these kind of resources and that it may actually been critical to human evolution and human dispersal. In South Africa over the last oh, 10 years especially, but 20 and 30 years, um, there are a series of what we call Middle Stone Age sites that date between about 165,000 years and about 55,000 years ago that are true shell middens that show that anatomically modern humans lived adjacent to South African coastlines and ate shellfish, some fish, scavenged sea mammals, um, mostly seals and sea lions, some whale meat. Uh, they find the, whale, the barnacles that lived on the whales in the sites, suggesting that they were taking beached whales, cutting off the skin and the blubber and transporting them to sites. And so here in South Africa, there's ample evidence that some of our earliest ancestors of anatomically modern humans were strongly reliant on marine resources. And then in uh, Central Africa, these are the Katanda harpoons that have become famous among archeologists and anthropologists. There's been some argument about whether these are really as old as they are. 
but they appear to be 80 to 90,000 years old. They're beautiful barbed bone harpoons that are found nowhere else in the world at this time, and they're associated with these enormous perch, uh, freshwater perch, I think these are, that can weigh 50 or 100 pounds, suggesting again that our ancestors, even away from the coast, were using a variety of aquatic resources. Then that feeds into the next paradigm, this idea that we didn't just evolve in savanna environments, but in fact, we were very closely tethered to fresh water and also freshwater resources. And this is, was really interesting when I first found out about this research, because I'm you know, really into the archeology. span I had no idea there was a parallel track of nutritional and physiological studies that were showing that with the rise in the size of the human brain, the hominin brain, that there are key resources it, the brain cannot function efficiently without. There are things like iodine, selenium, DHA, something called doco, docosohexanoic acid, I think it is. It's a fatty acid. And other micronutrients that are found primarily, not entirely, but primarily in shellfish, fish, aquatic plants, and other marine foods. And you need ready access to them on a regular basis because human bodies don't synthesize these things. You think about iodized salt, we all take it for granted. It's iodized because people didn't used to get enough iodine around the world. And roughly 20 to 40% of the human, human population suffered from one form or another, one severity or another, of something called cretinism, which is basically inadequate brain function and support be simply because you didn't get enough iodine. Where is there a lot of iodine? Shellfish, seaweeds, marine foods, aquatic food. So if you're not in constant touch with these things, it's very difficult to remain a large-brained organism with a high-functioning intellect and, and health. Well, I've mentioned that we have this fundamental problem with the archaeological record. Rising seas, falling seas, moving shorelines, it obscures 90% of the Pleistocene record of human occupation and use of coastal zones. We have another line of evidence, thankfully, that's helping fill these gaps, and it has to do with DNA among modern peoples and increasingly ancient DNA from ancient human skeletons that's telling us a lot about the patterns of human dispersal as they moved out of Africa. Um, the general consensus at the moment is that, as I said earlier, anatomically modern humans moved out of Africa 80 to 60,000 years ago, that they moved into Southern Asia. Many people think that they followed the Southern Asian coast. We've just written a paper uh, that I hope will be published soon that calls out something called the mangrove highway hypothesis that suggests that mangrove systems, forest systems, that are intertidal, three-dimensional, rich in resources of both the land and the sea. They're all over the South Asian coast, the East African coast, the West Australian coast, and that those estuaries may have facilitated the movement of, of anatomically modern humans as they quickly spread from Africa along the south coast of Asia, reaching Australia 50,000 years ago or so. Um, and the resources found in those mangrove systems are very similar all the way from Africa to Australia. So people moving along that shoreline would have found very similar resources. It would have been very easy for them to adapt as they moved. Uh, we know for sure at this point that Australia, Western Melanesia up here, uh, Papua New Guinea were colonized by anatomically modern humans at least 45,000 years ago, maybe 50, maybe even a little more. There's a lot of argument about the actual timing. I generally teach to my classes that it's 50,000 plus or minus 5,000. To get there, both to Australia from Southeast Asia, and also, again, into the Bismarck Archipelago, New Ireland, up in here, required multiple sea voyages, some of them 80 to 100 kilometers long, some of them with no visibility of islands offshore. There may have been wildfires, there may have been birds flying across, so that humans would have known there was land there, but they had boats of fairly sophisticated caliber to cross these long straits multiple times in multiple directions. So this too shows us 
without archaeological evidence that people were living on the coast, that they had to have had boats, seafaring, and they probably had at the same time fishing societies, maritime uh, adaptation. So we also know, I just talked about this area here, but we also know that the islands between Taiwan and Japan, the Ryukyu Islands, also had long water gaps, some of them up to 200 kilometers wide. And people spreading probably from Taiwan, which connected to the mainland during lower periods of sea level, clearly colonized the Ryukyu Islands as much as 35, maybe even 36,000 years ago. And then they also moved into Japan, which at times was connected to the mainland, but there are offshore islands that have obsidian flows that we know at least 30,000 years ago, people were using boats to access that obsidian, bringing it back to the Japanese mainland. Now I've also filled in some evidence for Pleistocene seafaring along the Pacific coast. It's much younger, but then, you know, isn't it possible, maybe probable, that as climate warmed after the end of the last glacial, 17 or 18,000 years ago, that these maritime peoples we know existed here spread up to the Kuril Islands, the Kamchatka Peninsula, and ultimately moved around the shoreline to Beringia and into the Americas. Possible. This is the picture, the 20th century picture of the ice-free corridor migration and also the Clovis first idea. It was very much a traditional terrestrial paradigm or model which suggested that these people were walking on foot, that they were hunting big game primarily, that they spread into the middle of the continent and then gradually, as they hunted out the large Pleistocene mammals, spread from coast to coast and then kind of slowly learned along the California coast that there were fish and shellfish and that in fact you could be maritime. When I was in graduate school, we were just coming out of this picture where literally people thought the California coast, nobody was fully maritime until about five or 6,000 years ago. And that before that, they were interior peoples from the Great Basin, they moved to the coast and kind of slowly figured it out. It was one way of looking at things. But you'll notice here that the state of California here becomes completely marginal to the peopling of the Americas because it's really an afterthought about these people who moved into the interior and later moved to the coast. Fortunately, things have changed. Uh, this is a more recent model of, of at least three ideas about how the Americas were peopled. You still see the land bridge, ice-free corridor hypothesis there, but now the coastal migration theory has become the predominant theory. It's gone from marginal to mainstream, we have Santa Rosa Island, I'll show you this in a minute. Uh, the genetics lately have suggested that people may have moved around the Pacific coast from Northeast Asia into the Americas between 15, 17, 18,000 years ago. It's not a real precise clock. It requires archeological evidence to calibrate it. But there are a series of sites, Monteverde down here. It's actually 14,000 years old, not 14,8. Santa Rosa at about 13,000 years, Channel Island sites that I'll talk about in a minute, Paisley Caves in Oregon. The museum that I run has a group of archeologists, including Dennis Jenkins, who's been working at Paisley Caves, has broken the Clovis barrier there, just as Monteverde did a number of years ago here, and shown that people were living in the Great Basin, in fact, at least 14,000, 14,500 years ago. Uh, at least a thousand years before Clovis. And there are some other sites over here that are somewhat controversial, this one less so, and then a very controversial topic that gets a lot of media play, the Seleucian hypothesis that suggests that people came, Upper Paleolithic peoples from the Iberian Peninsula followed kind of an ice edge uh, environment along the North Atlantic and colonized Eastern North America as much as 20,000 years ago. Well, the coastal migration theory has really been out there since about 1979, when Knut Fladmark at the University of British Columbia published the first detailed paper on the idea. Um, as I said, I've written about it for many years. I've written about it carefully. It's a model, it's a theory, hypothesis that needs to be tested. 
a few years ago, 2001, I think it was, I got together with a group in Santa Barbara that was looking at the deep history of human impacts on marine fisheries. And I was paired with a series of coastal ecologists who studied kelp forests. I'd been working in Alaska, Channel Islands, Oregon coast for years. I knew something about kelp forests, how productive they were. I knew we were finding some resources that came out of kelp forest habitats. But what I didn't realize until I got together with this group of people who knew more than anyone in the world about kelp forests was that they existed from northern Japan to Kamchatka into the Aleutians, I knew that. They actually go up into the Barents Sea. They live under sea ice in the summer. They fluoresce when the sea ice melts. That they come all the way down to Baja, California. That after a break in the tropics that probably narrowed in the last glacial maximum when things were colder, they pick up again along the Andean coast, go all the way around Tierra del Fuego. This is a broad, I mean, continental scale expanse of a ribbon of riches, basically, of kelp forests that may not have been continuous, but they existed around much of the Pacific Rim at exactly the time when we think people moved into the New World, potentially by boat. We wrote a paper called the Kelp Highway Hypothesis, which is basically an ecological corollary of the coastal migration theory. And I was amazed after writing about the coastal migration theory for 20 years, how much media attention we got. And all it had to do with was kelp highway hypothesis. I didn't come up with that moniker, it was one of the biologists. But it was just proved to me the power of marketing. You come up with a catchy phrase and all of a sudden the media wants to talk about it. Well, it really is just a corollary of the coastal migration theory. That proposes that. Kelp forests. They grow in rocky nearshore habitats from intertidal to 30 meters deep, sometimes deeper depending on water clarity. They thrive in cool and cold waters literally around the world. South Africa, those Middle Stone Age sites are found adjacent to kelp forests. Um, they're among the most productive habitats on earth. Giant kelp can grow one, two, three feet per day incredibly product productive, creating tremendous amounts of organic material that feeds complex food chains, provides three-dimensional habitat, underwater forests basically, for a wide variety of animals, and are associated with some of the earliest coastal archaeological sites in the Americas, and as I mentioned, around the world. But we started to explore some of these ideas. And one of the things we pointed out in that paper was that these kelp forests provide very, just like the mangrove highway idea I told you about earlier, they provide similar habitat and edible foods around the Pacific Rim, from Japan to Baja, California at least. Hundreds of similar shellfish, fish, marine mammals, seabird, and seaweed species that are all edible. So what does that mean to maritime people that might have been spreading from Japan into the New World it means that they could follow a single linear route into the new world along an ecotonal edge between land and sea with a diversity and wealth of resources. And in many cases, those resources would have been either the identical species or in the same genus, all the way from Japan to Baja, California. My wife, Christina, and I have a paper in press with Todd Bragy right now that lists, I think we have four or five tables with a hundred species in every table around the North Pacific Rim that are found over vast areas. So what I'm pointing out here is that for people dispersing around the coastal margins, there would have been very little ecological resistance to that movement. They would have been adapted to kelp forests in northern Japan, and they would have found kelp forests, not continuously, but kelp forests and estuaries and other coastal habitats with similar resources the entire way. No mountain ranges in the way, no deserts. Much easier, I think, for people to move around, uh, to disperse over broad areas relatively quickly. Another thing that's um, in the last 10 years or so that's come to light is that people talk about Beringia, this subcontinent that connected Alaska to Siberia during periods of lower sea level. And they used to not even be interested in the coastlines of Beringia because everybody thought they came walking across the Beringian land bridge and went down the ice-free corridor. 
But as the paradigm has shifted and there's been greater emphasis on the coastal migration theory, uh, people have become more interested in modeling the changes in the south coast of Beringia, and instead of what they used to call just this you know, awful linear route with very few resources, what we find now is that in fact there were thousands of islands, convoluted coastlines, not mountain ranges, just low-lying areas with very convoluted coasts that are actually ideal for people in boats because those bays, those inlets, those fjords provide protected habitat and the more linear habitat of intertidal zone and nearshore zone you have, the higher the productivity of shellfish, fish, and seamount. So this is a much different picture than we had in the 1980s. I want to quickly just show you a model of kelp forests that were in southeast Alaska that was done by a friend of mine, geologist Jim Bachetel. This is what Sitka, uh, Juno just off the map to the north, Ketchikan down in here somewhere, I can't remember exactly where, and kelp forests being relatively limited. He modeled the change in shorelines and kelp forests through the last glacial maximum to the present. So I'll show you this once or twice, but this shows you the challenge of trying to find along the northwest coast early coastal archaeological sites. Watch this area on the outer coast in particular, how much it changes. That's 25 kilometers of additional coastline that's been added from 13,000 radiocarbon years, 15,000 calendar years ago, to the modern time. But he also suggests that there was a lot more kelp forest habitat along those outer coastlines than there are today. I'll do it once more, just so you can see it again. How challenging it is for an archaeologist working on land or underwater to try to find sites associated with the earliest migration into the New World. The same thing happens when you come down to our area. Southern California Bight, California Channel Islands, I've worked primarily on uh, the northern islands that you see up there, San Miguel, Rosa, Santa Cruz, and Anacapa. But I've also been lucky enough to do a little work on Clemente and San Nicolas. Um, but here's what they looked like in the past. So the islands that we see today, in many cases, were surrounded by broad coastal plain. Look at San Nicolas here. We are looking at... 40 kilometers maybe, 30 kilometers of different additional shoreline. The mainland, you see areas of broad expanse that are now submerged. When you get an island packer's boat and go from Ventura to Santa Cruz Island, as you go halfway to the islands, you get out towards the oil drilling platforms. That's where the shoreline was. You're on a boat for 30 minutes before you even get to the shoreline that the first Americans would have found. So again, it's very challenging to find the evidence for the earliest occupations. There also were a couple of islands that don't exist anymore, now been submerged. There's also some areas here, the east coast, northeast coast of San Clemente, where things dive directly into the sea, and there's been very little change. So again, there are some places where you can look, or you can see a submarine canyon right up here, heading for Point Doom in Ventura County. There are some areas you can look where shorelines haven't moved that far. Well, focus on the northern islands, and this is what we call Santa Rosé Island until it broke up into the four modern islands. This is about 13,000 years ago, the, the gold, I think it is, out here. Uh, 11,000 years ago there, and then about 9,000 to 9,500 years ago. And once again, I've shown some of the early known archaeological sites like Arlington, some sites on San Miguel, and look how far the shorelines are from where those coastal sites are now located. We're missing 90% of the record. Because if these are maritime people focused on marine resources primarily, as you would expect on the Channel Islands, they were living most of the time on the shorelines and only coming into the interior periodically for certain reasons, plant foods, water, maybe tool stone to make stone tools. Well, let me go over a little bit of the Channel Island record. Um, one of the reasons that it, the islands are famous is because of this site. Arlington Springs Man was discovered in 1959, I think, by Phil Orr, Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History. 
Uh, it's gone from Arlington man to Arlington woman, back to Arlington man again. And it was originally dated to about 10,000 radiocarbon years ago, but it was doubted, those dates were doubted by a lot of people. John Johnson and his colleagues, Tom Stafford, in recent years have redated the Arlington skeletal remains to about 13,000 years ago. It's the same age as Clovis, 13,000 calendar years. And we know there was a human there that died accidentally, fell into a gully, and basically his bones were buried 37 feet, 11 meters below the present uh, on this coastal terrace and just fortuitously discovered by Phil Orr. Uh, there's been quite a bit of archaeology in this area recently, some of which I'll show you in a minute as some of our own, but they've reopened the area at Arlington, redated it, and they found a couple tiny flakes of stone that were made by humans, but no tools that were diagnostic. I assumed for years, because this was a Clovis age, and a team I had working for me in the 1980s found a Clovis point on the Santa Barbara coast, just across the channel, that this was probably a Clovis person. I now believe it probably was not a Clovis person, for reasons that I'll show you in a minute or two. I was lucky enough uh, to work for eight years, nine years, at a site called Daisy Cave on San Miguel Island. Arlington Springs is on Santa Rosa there in the, in the distance. And here you can see the stratigraphy at Daisy Cave. This layer is about 3,000 years old, 6,600 years old, 8,600 years old, 10,000 years old. And down here you can barely see it, about 11,600 years old. Layers of human occupation. Initially, I doubted that this was actually human occupation because there were no tools but we found later that there were a few undiagnostic, nondescript stone tools that showed people were there at least 11,600 years ago. There's a phenomenal record at this site, uh, especially of later what we call paleocoastal occupations. These are coastal Paleo-Indian peoples. Uh, Chipstone Crescent on the upper left. I'll show you a lot more of these later. An unusual artifact, a number of them, quite a large number, have been found in San Diego and Orange County, and they are quite significant. We were lucky enough there, because of the rare preservation conditions, to find some woven materials. These are sandal fragments that date to about 9,000 years ago. We have early bone fish hooks, the oldest date to about 10,000 years ago. Uh, shell beads and also some more woven cordage and what are called monkey fist knots. Those are actually from a cave nearby called Cave of the Chimneys, and date to about 8,600 years old. And then, for years, this point right there, that projectile point, made me wonder. It was found by an earlier excavator of Daisy Cave, Charles Rosaire, from the LA County Museum of Natural History, and it's totally anomalous for the layer it seemed to come from. And I assumed it had fallen out of the wall and fallen into a deeper layer, because it looks like a little arrow point. These same kind of arrow, arrow points have been found on the islands for years by early mapping expeditions and early antiquarians and archaeologists. There are quite a lot of them in museum collections on the East Coast and elsewhere in France, but nobody ever knew what they dated to. We always assumed that they were arrow points and therefore they could only be 1,000 to 1,500 years old. Here's some more. These were found by... Uh, Ralph Glidden from Catalina, working on San Miguel for the, uh, what was then the Hay Museum, it's now the American Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C. And he said this was a ceremonial point. It was so delicate that it couldn't possibly have been functional. But there's a bunch of them in the American Museum of Natural History that look like that. Needle-shaped tips, incredibly delicate barbs, long, thin stems, there are hundreds of these in museum collections. They're clearly not ceremonial, and we now know that they're not, arrow, well, they might be arrow points, but I doubt it. But they're much older. Here's some more. Bowers in 1873, Philip Mills Jones on Santa Rosa Island in 1901, Charles Rosaires at San Miguel Island, Daisy Cave. And then Mike Glassow, my mentor at UCSB in 2008 publication described 
three or four of these that he found in a stratified shell midden deposit, the first time they'd ever been found stratified, that dated to 8,400 years old. And it was like, bingo. It was shocking at first, but it also just made us think, my goodness, if these are that old, and there's hundreds of them in museum collections, what do they mean? What does it mean about how many people there were on the island and what the sophistication of their technologies were in the early Holocene or the terminal Pleistocene? Well, I was working at Daisy Cave and Cave of the Chimneys. I got done there. We started mapping, dating and mapping all the early sites we could find on San Miguel Island. We found more than 50 of them in a matter of just a few years, including several that produced those tiny little points and also chipstone crescents. And they date between 12,200 to about 8,000 years. And then the crescents and what we call Channel Island Bar points appear to disappear. They're not found after that. We're not sure why. But remember that this is the tip of the iceberg. The shorelines are out here. These are coastal people. We're only seeing their interior aspects of their adaptations. And yet we have 50 sites. And every time we go out there, we find you know, one, two, three, four more. So I think, in, you know, this was really changed my viewpoint about paleo-coastal occupations of the islands. I started to think they must have got there earlier than we ever believed, and there must have been a lot more people on that landscape early than we ever would have thought possible. So at that point, one day I took a shortcut we were working on a much younger site off to the left here, and I came across an area that I really hadn't walked across, this eroded area. Started finding chipstone bifaces by the, the dozen at least, which was very rare on the island. And then I started finding Channel Island barb points and crescents. And I realized that we had stumbled on a badly eroded paleocoastal site. I got my son and Torben Rick and we started come up and surface collected it. We went back multiple times. This site is 600 meters wide by 350 meters long. There are about four of these sites in that area. And the more we looked, we found intact soil patches that still had datable material shellfish in them, mostly large red abalone shell. When we dated them, they dated between 12,200 and 11,400 years ago. We found 400 to 500 bifaces here in about two or three years. In Daisy, at Daisy Cave in eight years, all the artifacts we found from this period fit in a matchbox. It should have been over here. It's only about a kilometer away, but we didn't know it existed. What's special about Cardwell Bluffs is that this is a very old raised beach. It doesn't have much soil on it, and the soil it has is what's called an argillic soil, ar argillosol, and it shrinks and swells, and when that happens, cobbles at the base rise to the surface, and the small sediments of soil fall to the bottom. So there are all these cobbles of chert, toolstone, that are being risen, they're rising to the surface where paleocoastal people were picking them up, breaking them up, making tools out of them, refurbishing their stone tools, their projectile points, and occasionally bringing up some shellfish the munch on. Here's what they look like. Uh, the left, ones on the left uh, I call a mole points, CIA points for short. Here's some crescents, eccentric crescents, uh, less eccentric crescents. I'll show you some lunate crescents in a minute. And then these are channel line barb points. This one's been reworked. Some of them are tiny, some of them are huge. But they're all, when they're finished, very thin, very delicate. These ones with barbs, long stems, very needle-like points, as I said. And the weird thing about it was there wasn't a single bone at the entire site. To this day, all we found is shellfish. So what does that mean? That they weren't hunting? Well, apparently not, because you don't need a mole points or crescents or Channel Island barb points to shoot abalones or mussels. So it left a little bit of a mystery. What are they doing to use these points? The answer to that came about a year later when Tori, Rick, and I were literally on a walk in the park when we didn't have a vehicle. We'd never walked a particular stretch. And this area right here had collapsed. Here down below, I walked up, found the dark soil here exposed. 
had chipstone flakes coming out of it and thousands of bird bones. And I was peering at that stuff. Tori came up the slope and started picking up crescents and Channel Island barb points like nobody's ever seen. I think we found 40 Channel Island barb points the first day and eight crescents. This, what's called SRI 512, right here, is very close to Arlington Springs. And once we found that, I started poking around in these old gullies that Orr, Bill Orr looked at years ago, and I had looked at in the 1980s. And I found another site, very similar. Very little shell, so almost invisible, but it had crescents, channel island bar points, bird bones, fish bones, sea mammal bones, things like that. This isn't showing up very well, but here's an assembly or part of the assemblage from 512. Red ochre, this been sawn, lunate crescents, Channel Island bar points. These are the size of arrow points. Some of them are that big. Any archaeologist, if they didn't know how old they were, you handed them to them, say, is this a dart point, a spear point, or an arrow point? They'd say it's an arrow point. Uh, some more preforms, bone tools. Really amazing site. 11,700 Cal BP. And what they're associated with thousands of bird bones primarily. There's fish bones, there's sea mammal bones, but it's mostly goose and albatross, large birds, migratory birds in this case, that live on the islands in the winter. So that suggests these people were here year round. Not out there on the summer, but were there year round. One bone burned of Chindites lawi, the extinct flightless duck, earliest evidence for human hunting of Chindites anywhere along the Pacific coast. And as we continued to do work, uh, this a mole point came from uh, SRI 26. This incredible crescent came from just an isolated find on San Miguel Island. Again, we realized just how exquisite these technologies were. These people were among the finest flint nappers in the history of North America. And Ralph Glidden and Augustus Hay said that in the 19, early 1900s. Well, what were those things used for? Here's what we think they were used for. I mean, that's pretty obvious. It's a projectile point. Incredible serration, needle-like tip, used for probably deep penetration, and then sticking it in some kind of probably sea mammal, marine mammal. The crescents, we think, along with other people who work in the Great Basin, were used for hunting birds as a transverse projectile point this is kind of a shotgun approach to hunting birds in flight, especially flocking birds, like that. And you think about it, if you shoot a, a dart or an arrow with a sharp tip through something like that, you're mostly going to miss. I've talked to people who hunt waterfowl with bow and arrow, and sometimes the, the arrow will go right through the body of a bird, and they'll keep flying. And they might die a kilometer down, but by then they're gone. In this case, we think those crescents were for hitting wings, hitting a neck, stunning a bird by hitting in the body, knocking it down, disabling it so you could get it. The interesting thing about crescents is that they've long been thought of as artifacts that are primarily found in the Great Basin. But when you quantify how many have been found in Western North America, there are actually thousands of them that have come from California. There's more than a thousand that have come from this Tulare Lake area, the Whip site right here. The Channel Islands has, I can't remember, six or eight hundred of them. Uh, there are thousands of them in California. And then their distribution, these date to the terminal Pleistocene and the early Holocene. They basically stopped here. And that's one crescent, one crescent, one crescent, one versus a thousand, hundreds, scores, the Great Basin has scores or hundreds, but they're heavily weighted towards Western North America. Well, what's that mean? Maybe they're just different cultural tradition than the Clovis people who are out here and are lightly represented in the far west. But the more I started to think about crescents and their role as in hunting waterfowl, I started to think about how North America has changed over the last 15 to 18,000 years since the last glacial maximum until, say, the early Holocene. It was wetter back then. Great Basin lakes were 
about eight times larger than they are today. Perfect waterfowl habitat. There was a, a fellow by the name of Stuart Fidel, very smart guy, wrote about the people in the New World, and he suggested that what brought humans through the ice-free corridor was a paper called Quacks in the Ice. I love that. <laughs> was migratory waterfowl coming down what's called the Central Flyway and flying through here, and people would have seen them going, and they followed them into the New World. He's not a proponent of the coastal migration theory. And what he forgot to mention is that there's a Pacific Flyway, too. It's even bigger than the Central Flyway. There's flyways over here, too. But they probably didn't exist 15,000 years ago because there was no Arctic habitat for birds to go to. The Central Flyway might have existed, but the most productive one would have been the Pacific Flyway where all these birds, by the millions, twice a year, go to Alaska, Beringia, and then turn around and fly back. The Central Valley of California has millions of geese and ducks every year. And they probably would have been even larger when there was more wetland habitat. So there's the waterfowl flyways. I would basically argue that these didn't exist or they were much attenuated down here and that the Pacific Flyway was the premier location for bird migrations back and forth and humans who were hunting them. And that explains, I think, why crescents are only found in the far west. It may be that there's a cultural difference, but I think it's ecological. That there just wasn't many birds to hunt out here. And so their distribution is heavily weighted to the west. And I want to work through this quickly. So, change of subject. When Clovis was king, polluted points down here. Clovis points. Everybody thought, virtually everybody thought, except for a few brave souls, that everything that came after was descended from me. Much of the western North America, the Great Basin, is a surficial archaeological record where everything's on the surface. So you find a Clovis point, that came first. You find a stemmed western stem point, well, that must be younger because that's the way we learned archaeology in graduate school. And then western stem that's associated with crescents and found out in the western North America, you know, it must have come later because it can't be younger than or older than Clovis. Which came first, Clovis or stem points? Dennis Jenkins, Paisley Caves, Eastern Oregon, pre-Clovis. These are sea caves in the middle of the desert. That's a shoreline, a lake shore. Those caves were formed by a high lake stand. The lakes dropped, people moved in. Dennis has become world famous for documenting in detail the association with Pleistocene megafauna, human coprolites, desiccated feces, from which he's extracted. He and his colleagues have extracted DNA, 14,300 years old, of human origin. There's Dennis, some of his team from the U of O. Got to tout my boys. Some of the things they found, twisted grass thread dated to later Clovis times, camel bones, 14,300, horse bones, 13,000 years old, human coprolite, 14,300 years old, produced human DNA. They have 800 of them. And stem point. Not sure quite how old it is, but it appears to be about 13,500 years old, which is older than Clovis. Alan Bryan, as Steve James suggested over dinner, argued that this was the case 50 years ago and was shouted down by the Clovis firsters and unfortunately died before this discovery happened. But his wife is still alive, Ruth. So this suggests that at Paisley Caves anyway, that stem points came first. Now, Charlotte Beck and George Jones, a few years ago in American Antiquity, published a paper about stem points in the west, Clovis points in the east, and suggested that Clovis spread westward and intermingled with stem point makers in the far west. Theirs was a North American analysis, and Todd Bragey and I had been studying the distribution of stemmed points around the broader Pacific Rim, thinking about the Kelp Highway hypothesis. And what we found was they have stem points in Japan, 
dated to 16,000 years, maybe 17,000, called incipient Jomon. The Jomon is the archaeological horizon descended from the Ainu people, not the modern Japanese, but the earlier Japanese population. And look at these stem points. And then look at my Santa Rosa Island stem point. This is a cheap trick, I'm telling you right now. But look at these things. They look very, very similar. Pacific Rim. What I've done here is I've plotted some ancient DNA evidence. Modern DNA studies of Native Americans suggest something called the D haplogroup. There's a particular one in the New World that's distributed along the coastlines all the way into South America and is kind of rare away from the coastline. It was found and suggested that this was a genetic marker of a very ancient 15 to 17,000 year old migration by a coastal route of humans into the Americas. There is ancient DNA evidence now from Jomon skeletons going back 8,000, 3,500, uh, Han Chinese skeletons about 5,000 years ago, Andrani's cave in southeast Alaska about 10,000 years ago, Anzic Clovis burial in Montana, 13,000 years old, D. haplotype. Recently published by Chatters and Kennett, Yucatan burial, D1, a derivative of this same D. haplotype that's found in coastal Japan. When the geneticists talk about this, nobody jeers at them, nobody laughs at them, nobody sounds skeptical, but when Todd and I tried to publish a paper about stem points, around the Pacific Rim, we had a hell of a time. <laughs> Archaeologists don't want to use projectile point typologies anymore to reconstruct human migrations. And I sort of understand that, but I think this matches up with the genetics, and it's also basically exactly what we'd expect if people move from, say, Japan, coastal Northeast Asia, into the New World, and these, by the way, go all the way to the southern tip of South America. And these are called fishtail points that are often fluted. Most of them come from surface sites. They haven't been well dated. But I think it's entirely possible that these stem points, these people, fishtail point makers, fluting their points, cross the isthmus into the Gulf of Mexico, developed fluted Clovis technology, and then moved westward, just as Charlotte Beck and George Jones suggested, and then mingled with the descendants of their own ancestors, the Western stem people and the Clovis people. It's a model, a hypothesis. It clearly needs more research to test. But I think it's a, a reasonable hypothesis. And the places where there are gaps are places like Beringia. There's a thousand kilometers of submerged coastline. Basically, an entire subcontinent has been submerged. So here's the picture now. We went from Clovis first, very simple. We all, including myself, thought we had it figured out. We knew when and how the new world was colonized. When Clovis first collapsed and Monteverde was accepted, it literally opened Pandora's box. And now we have the Salutrian hypothesis. We've got geneticists saying people came over the North Pole. We have biological anthropologists, I think, saying, oh, no, they came from New Ireland and Australia across the Pacific and then moved up this way. And then we have the more conventional ideas of the ice-free corridor and the coastal migration theory. One more comment, the Salutrian hypothesis, Dennis Stanford and Bruce Bradley published a major book on this. And one of their arguments has been based on what they call ultra-thin technology. Salutrian points and Clovis points that are very long, very broad, and very thin. And they argue that this is fundamentally different than the Pacific Rim model of leaf-shaped points and stem points, which are thick. But they never measured those Japanese tang points, and they didn't know about our Channel Island points when they wrote that. And those, the Channel Island one anyway, are ultra thin. And I just got an email today from one of my former students who got a bunch of data on 
incipient Jomon points from Japan, says they're just as thin as our Channel Island ones, and they all type out as arrow points. So ultra thin technology cannot distinguish between this model and that model. Okay, summarize and conclude. Coastlines were used for millions of years, certainly hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years. Very different picture than uh, we believed 50 years ago or even 30 years ago, 20 years ago. It appears that with anatomically modern humans, people like us, we had greater probably intellectual, intellectual capacity, although we don't know how that worked. We see very rapid technological change, sophisticated technologies of a variety of types, you know, Middle Stone Age, Late Stone Age, Upper Paleolithic, Mesolithic, Iron Age, just very rapid, innovative technological change. And with those people, fishing technologies greatly expand. So we start getting boats and harpoons and nets and things like that that greatly expand human ability to extract resources from lakes, rivers, and seas. And that, I think, contributed to the demographic expansion of anatomically modern humans. They were using all kinds of resources, plants, large game on land, but they were also using those coastal aquatic resources, which allowed larger populations and forced people to keep moving. Coastlines then were paths of least cost and least resistance for early human dispersal, estuaries and kelp forests providing similar resources over very broad ocean bases, which facilitated a rapid movement, I think, of coastal people. Clovis first, I usually say Clovis first is dead in the water, but I went, we were in Wyoming here a few weeks ago and they're a little sensitive about that. So I edited this down to just saying dead. Clovis first is dead. They need to get used to it. Most, almost everybody has, but they're steward, wake up. We need to look for reasonable alternatives. It is increasingly likely, I think, but not proven that a coastal migration contributed to the initial colonization of the Americas. I think it's possible, maybe even probable, that this early Western standpoint tradition may mark a Pacific Rim migration from Northeast Asia to the Americas, much as that D haplotype suggests from genetic remains, and that it may have started 16,000, maybe even 18,000 years ago. I think these coastal peoples may have followed not just the coastlines. This wasn't, you know, hell-bent for San Diego or Orange County. This was a gradual demographic expansion of people down the coast. They moved into estuaries. They adapted to those riches of the estuaries. And in the northwest coast, where there are huge fisheries of salmon and anadromous fish, it would have been not... I mean, it would have been entirely logical for them not just to keep moving down the coast, but to butt off and follow the estuaries, these big salmon runs of the rivers, deep into the interior of North America, up into the Continental Divide. If you follow the Columbia or the Klamath Rivers, the Sacramento River, where there were big fisheries, you inevitably get to the Great Basin, interior areas, and then you see this fluorescence of adaptations, sometimes focused more on large game, and terrestrial resources. And then also that these same people may have crossed the Isthmus of Panama, as I said earlier, moving into the Gulf of Mexico, developing Clovis and spreading north. And most of all, I, well, I really like this part, California is not marginal to the peopling of the Americas anymore. It's central, and that's where it should be. And there's still a tremendous amount of research to be done on the Channel Islands, and right here in Orange County to try and figure out when people first made it to coastal California, how they got here, and the myriad adaptations that they developed in the process. It's a fascinating topic. I leave you with this along with my thank you of archaeology's last frontier. The answers may not lie on land. They may ultimately lie offshore along some of these submerged coastlines, and it's going to take time, careful thought, careful research, and a lot of money to find it. <laughs> Thank you very much.
found that was super fascinating, and I think you can see why 